Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's 10 o'clock. And I'm happy to present to you the last, the fifth and the last in our lecture series for 2024, Ramadan. Um, before I get to the speaker, let me just go through the do's and don'ts. Please, even if the system doesn't mute you, keep yourself mute. That's the only way we can hear the only the speaker and then we can understand what he's teaching us. Keep posting your questions even before we have started and during and after the lecture. We will have about one hour uh, for the lecturer to answer some of your questions. And if he can, he will answer all of them. Um, proper names, please. There is, as I speak, simultaneous live airing on YouTube. Uh, we are going to reach a limit, which is 1,000, very, very soon. And um, considering the number at this time, that is what always happens. And the last two lectures, we have hit the 1,000 limit. Just direct your guests to YouTube. It is the same lecture. It is the same person speaking. And it is um, simultaneous, uh, maybe two seconds behind, but it's the same lecture. Thank you very much. Now to the guest speaker. We have with us today somebody who sincerely doesn't need any, any introduction. Um, 14th Emir of Kano, former governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, former managing direct, group managing director of First Bank, um, a nationalist and an Islamic scholar uh, of note and the head of the Tijaniya movement in Nigeria. It gives me uh, a great pleasure to welcome His Highness Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, MS2 as he's fondly called. The platform is yours, so that I don't keep taking all your time. Thank you. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmed, who won a Sarin, who won a Sakfir, who won a Tawakalo Ali, who won a Sahdi. When all the Bilahi, Mishruri and Fusina was say at Amalina. Men Yahid Hilla, who fell a modilla, or men you did fell a hadilla. Asheru Allah ilah illa law, who are the Hula Sherikala, where Ashadu and the Sayyidana when a Biana Mohammedan Abduhu or a solo. Let me begin by greeting all the brothers and sisters on this platform. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And let me uh, thank. Uh, of Allah for the invitation to share some thoughts. Um, I'm not uh, really in a position to say I'm teaching anyone, but it is um, for us to sit down and to remind ourselves of things that we know or to strengthen uh, the knowledge of that which we have already known. Um, I chose to speak today on some dimensions of ibadah. Um, ibadah being the link between a servant and his Lord, between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the reason all messengers were sent, the Quran is filled with statements from the messengers of Allah alayhi uh, salam saying to their people, Ya qawmi abudullaha my people serve Allah or worship Allah or be slaves to Allah. Uh, you do not have any Lord except him. And for us, uh, every time we stand up to pray in every rakah, uh, we read the Surah Al-Fatiha in which we find you alone do we worship and from whom from you alone do we seek 
um, help. Uh, some scholars have said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed 104 books. Uh, he combined uh, the knowledge and the meanings of those 104 books into three, uh, the a Torah, the Torah, uh, the, the Injila, the Gospel of Jesus, and the Quran, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He summarized the knowledge of the Quran in the Mufassal, the part of the Quran beginning with uh, Surah Al-Qaf to Surah Al-Nas. And he put all the meanings of those were of, of the of the, of those of the Mufassal in Surah Al Fatiha in Iyakan Abud wa Iyakan Asain. So this is the purpose for which human beings were created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wama khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liyabudun. I did not create mankind and jinn except that they uh, worship me. Yet we do not pay much attention to the meaning of this link, to the meaning of the nature of this relationship. Of course, we pray, we fast, uh, we say we believe in God, but we need to sometimes reflect on what does it mean when you actually say that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you actually say you're doing ibadah, when you say you are a servant of Allah and an abd. Uh, the word uh, abadah in, in Arabic, um, has the meaning of something that is low compared to something else that is high. So if you go to the the farms and uh, you, you can find a footpath, the footpath is easily identified because human beings and animals have suppressed it and it's lower than the right and the left. And that is called tariqun um, mu'abbad, um, a path that is lowered because um, it has been trod upon by people um, someone who falls in love and because of love um, is totally controlled by his lover um, they say um, uh, love has debased him that means he has um, it, it has totally conquered him totally overpowered him so when 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 we speak about um, or service it's a combination of two things it's a combination of the complete sense of uh, humility and lowness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined with complete and total love for Allah. The abd, which is usually translated in English uh, in many of the books now as a servant, originally actually just means a slave. It's a slave. And we are slaves in the sense that we are owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're created by him. Our ashes are created by him. There is nothing we do that is outside um, his power and outside his control. And we are supposed to basically basically devote ourselves and only do that which he commands us and avoid that which he has uh, prohibited. Now, this obudia, uh, in this um, servanthood um, a relationship between us and Allah, um, in general, when you deal with humanity, um, takes two forms. There is the general obodia, obodia am. Um, so somebody is saying they cannot hear anything. I don't know if um, ca ca can can you hear me? I saw. I am hearing clearly, and if I'm hearing clearly, I think oh, this is okay. Hearing clearly. Okay. So, so there is the obodia uh, am. Uh, which is the um, relationship that is universal. In this relationship, the Quran refers to it in several um, verses. Every single thing that is created um, is a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the heavens and the earth and all that they contain. Uh, so when, when referring to uh, the Christians who say Jesus Christ is a God, for example, Allah says, Allah 
in kullu man fi samawati wal ardi illa ati rahman abja you know he says they 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 say that god has taken a son um and and this is um, a monstrous sin indeed to say the heavens um uh, almost got rent asunder and the earth uh, feel, feels like being scattered um and the and the and, and the mountains uh, almost crash because of this claim that god has a son everything that is in the heavens and the earth is but a slave to allah and uh you know um allah refers to all of us uh as as uh, as his servants as his slaves in allah kad hakama bain al ibad allah has um given um has ruled among uh, among his servants um so in that sense um in the sense that we are all created by god in the sense that we all, we all um um are under his control under his power there is nothing we can do that is outside his mashia outside his will okay we are all servants and slaves of allah we are all um a bad of allah but there's something about the style of the quran the quran refers to everything as servants but then he, there there are there are times when allah uh, decides to um own the servant okay he uses the pronoun my servant Ab, uh, he talks about abdi or ibadi my servants now when he uses that or ibadur rahman when he uses terms like that it's a different type of ibadah it's um, the ibadah khassa and this is because among men and jinn we have those who have accepted that he's their lord and master and who worship him and do his will we have others who do not who worship others who love others um, the way they love allah or even love others more than they love allah whether it is their idol or a human being or whatever or their desires and this um ubudiyah khassa which is the one that will save us um on the day of judgment is the one where you recognize that the lord who created you is also the one lord who is worthy of worship and um so we 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 hear for example allah says wa ibadur rahman alladhina yamshuna ala ardi hawlan wa idha khatabahum al-jahiluna qalu salama to the end of surah al-furqan or he says uh, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْكُمُ الْيَوْمَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ تَعْسَلُونَ Or say, or, um, the, you know, where it says, Ya, my servants, there is no, no fear upon you on this day, this on, on the day of, of judgment, and um, you will not uh, be, be sad at all. Or, um, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنْفُسِمْ لَا تَقَدْتُمْ بِالرَّحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O oh, my servants who have transgressed among um against yourselves do not lose hope um in the in the mercy of Allah so whenever Allah talks about ibadi my servants or ibadur rahman the servants of ar rahman he's talking about those who have now accepted because there's there are those who have not and there are those who have and this is the difference between um uh, human beings and jinns on the one hand and the rest of creation because uh, human beings accepted this responsibility uh وَحَمَلَ هَلْ إِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ذَلُومًا جَهُولًا And um, it is that responsibility that separates us uh, from others because we have taken the responsibility to choose to, be, to believe or not, uh, or not to believe. In fact, the only place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses ibadi uh, to include those who have not um, given faith in Him, He specifies, He says, ibadi هَا أُولَئِ uh, where, where where Allah says to 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 the idols, "Antum uh, adnaltum ibadi ha ulai amhum dalusabil." Are you the ones who um, misled my servants? These my servants, or did they um, lose lose their path? So what is ibadah? Ibadah combines, as I said, the um, extreme the most extreme form of humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the most complete love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
uh, if you humble yourself before God but do not love him, you're not a complete servant. If you claim to love him but do not humble yourself before him, you're not a complete servant. The, the meaning of ibadah is, bo is both, and Allah demands both, which is why he demands that you love him more than you love anything else. And you do not love him with somebody else or something else. You love all things because of your love for him. Uh, Allah says, among, among mankind, you have those who take um, uh, similitudes to Allah, arrivals to Allah, and they love them the way they love Allah. But those who believe preserve their, their highest love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, he also challenges us. Uh, where he says, uh, uh, he says to the Prophet to say to us, if your parents and your children and your families and friends and your um, uh, and your wealth that you have gathered and your um, transactions where you fear loss of profit and the residences that you have built, if they are more beloved to you, if you love them more than Allah and his prophet and the struggle for the sake of Allah, then wait until Allah comes with his punishment. So Allah makes it very clear that if you are really um, his servant, if you see yourself as an Abd, Abdullah, you love him and you love him alone. Whatever you love, you love because of Allah. What you dislike, you dislike because of Allah. So you love because of him. We love our prophets. We love the messengers. We love this. We love uh, the people of God. We love good people because they are doing what Allah SWT loves. You love for his sake. You hate for his sake. This is part of the meaning uh, of um, of um, of of Ubudia. Now, when does ibadah become uh, accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Because when you say Iya Kana Abudu, you alone we worship. You need to understand it. It, you are, it imposes upon you the need to know two things. First to know that which you are worshipping, because you say, Iyaka, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you need to know his names, you need to know his attributes, you need to know his deeds, you need to know uh, what, uh, what has to be, uh, what he's, he has to be freed from in terms, in, terms, uh, in terms of description, but you also need to know how to worship him, because you don't just worship him the way you want to worship him, worship him the way he wants you to worship him. Now, how do you know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is why Allah says, Say, if you indeed love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow me. And if you follow me, uh, Allah will love you. So a number of conditions. So you have uh, the condition is if you love Allah, you follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means following the sunnah is evidence of your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also, he says, uh, If you follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you get the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, for ibadah to be accepted, it must contain two things. One, there must be ikhlas, okay, which means that what you do is purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do not pray so that people see you. You do not do things so that people praise you. You do not think because you are afraid of people criticizing you. Uh, you do not do things for anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah keeps repeating that um, he accepts only that which is for him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, um, Allah is the most um, um, 
on the 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 most um i don't know what when, when you've got everything you want okay he's the most he's the mo he's most well bestowed um he, he's an agnes shuraka he's the most um he's one the most lacking in need among among partners so if you join him with a partner uh in any kind of act he leaves it for the partner he says go to him and take your reward he does not share okay so um and allah SWT says wa ma umiru ila liya'budullaha mukhlisina lahu ddeen they have not been commanded except that they worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifying the deen for him and mukhlis uh that which is purified you when you take gold for example or silver and put it in the fire and remove all the dirt and all the sins from it and have pure gold pure gold you say this is the heaven khalis this is pure gold so um when allah says talks about ikhlas he's talking about purifying your prayer purifying your worship and taking out anything yes the most self-sufficient agna thank you very much taking taking away every single thing uh, other than allah from it and it's purely for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now if your work if your worship if your ibadah is not for allah in this world we will all say that you've done it uh, you know if you pray we see you you are a good muslim you pray all the time you're in the mosque uh we see you you say you're fasting you go for hajj you go for umrah every year you do all the good things in this world we all praise you but uh, please know that on the day uh uh, of Akhirah, the only thing that will count is that which is inside, which is in your heart. Which is why, even in prayer, in when you look at all the acts of worship, Allah stresses the inner dimension of Islamic worship. He says, uh, for example, فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ uh, لَا uh, إِلَى Know that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't just say it, you know it, your heart says it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in um, uh, says uh, that um, the believers um, uh, have um, that the believers um, have will prosper and these are the ones that are um, God, humble and God fearing in their prayer because if you pray and your mind is not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will say you pray, but Allah doesn't accept it. In fact, Allah says, Wainun lil musallina ladina hum asalatim sahun. You pray, but your mind is not with Allah on the day of judgment, you are cursed. So it's about the heart. Okay? The fast that we have, we're all fasting in Ramadan. Allah says, Kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum la allakum tatakun. This fast has been made uh my goodness, Hajra, let me see. Uh, I'm told to adjust my camera. I don't know. Uh, your your uh, camera is fine. Everything is going well. Just carry on. Hajra, I, would... right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a message from your from uh, from the host saying I should adjust my camera. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know it's... if this is okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, okay. She says perfect now. Okay. So um so we're fasting, Allah says uh, he has prescribed this fasting of, um upon us um so that my goodness, now I can see my bed, brother, but I hope you don't mind. So uh, he uh, so he says to us we should um um he's prescribed fasting for us so that we are God fearing. Allah. Uh, that, that you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when you slaughter, when you slaughter a lamb or a cow, it says, The blood or the flesh of that which is slaughtered does not get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What gets to him is a taqwa from your heart. So um, it's about the, in, the inner dimension um, of worship. Therefore, ikhlas is the, is, is the heart of ibadah. But then, this is the inner dimension. The outer dimension is that Ibadah has to be in line with the Sunnah. And the Quran keeps coming up with this over and over and over again. That he 
who seeks, who he who desires um, to receive the mercy of his Allah does two things. You do amal saleh, which means you you work, uh, you, you you do your work, you do your deeds in line in, in line with the sunnah, uh, do the good deeds, and you do not take any partners uh, with Allah subhanahu wa taala. So ibadah has to combine ikhlas and mutabah, um, sincerity and of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, uh, following um, the sunnah of the Prophet um, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, um, this brings me to, to a point um, of controversy because um, we're in a world now where uh, there's a whole debate over what is sunnah and what is bid'ah. Okay, it's again uh, one of the dimensions, and and it's 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 co- it has caused a lot of furore. It has caused a lot of heat. It has um, led to some people calling people innovators. It has led some people calling people even non-Muslims. And I think it's important to understand um, what is the mafhum, what is the actual meaning of innovation um, in Islam. So we have. Um, thanks to the uh, ascendancy of uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, we have a definition that has been going around all the time uh, that anything that was not done by the Prophet or by the companions or by the Tabi'een or by the Ba'ut Tabi'een is a bid'ah, balala, it is, it is an innovation that is prohibited and it is not Islamic. The interesting thing about this is that while this is the foundation of the da'wah of a whole group of people, you will not find a single verse of the Quran or a single hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that said that anything not done by these three generations cannot be done. Nothing. But it has become uh, a theme and it has become the truth. The reality is that this is a view held by, I mean, historically, by only three scholars, by Imam Shatibi in Al-Itisam, by Ibn Taymiyyah and his disciple Ibn Qayyim, and then those who follow them, Ibn Abdul Wahhab and so on. The vast majority of Muslim scholars have never had that understanding because there is a distinction between not doing something and prohibiting something. What has not been explicitly prohibited cannot be called haram. And cannot be uploaded. So the hadiths that they use, uh, you have a hadith, Allah say, uh, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, um, uh, hadi, hadi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa inna kulla muhdathatin bid'a, wa kulla bid'atin dalala, wa kulla dalalatin finnar. This is a, a common hadith that is, is, it is in Bukhari, it is in Muslim. Okay, part of it says, Everything that is innovated, that that is brought up without example, is a bid'ah. Uh, every every, every bid'ah is is uh, is going astray, and all those who go astray, all the all things that go astray lead you to um, to, to to hellfire. Now, they will tell you the prophet says, every innovation is the lie. Now, first of all, uh, while kullu in, in, in Arabic is um, what's called, uh, is one, one, of, one of those um, terms that's called al fadl umum, the terms of, um, that, that are all encompassing, in, in Arabic, there's something called an amun maqsus. So you have a general statement, but it always has exceptions. And you have examples um, galore, even in the Quran. Um, Allah says in, in, in Surah Al-Haqqaf, he says, uh, to demiru kulla shayin bi amri rabbiha. He was refer- referring to the wind that 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 he sent uh, to to the art to the art. Said it destroyed everything. To demiru kulla shayin bi amri rabbiha. It destroyed everything in its path over the command of his Allah. And then he says, "For as bahu la yura illa basaytibu." But then um, by the morning, nothing was seen except their hopes. Okay, and it is understood from there that what, although he said kul shayin, everything actually is everything except the masakin, except 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 the holes. Now, on this particular hadith and on similar hadith such as uh, 
man ahdath fi amri na hada ma laysa min fahu warad he who comes with something in in this our religion that is not of it um is returned to him we we ask these brothers to go back and read what is the commentary of the scholars of the hadith on this hadith what is the commentary of hafid ibn hajar on this hadith in bukhari for example um in um fatul bari what is the commentary of imam an nawawi in sahih muslim on this hadith and what all these scholars are agreed on is that there's a distinction between um bid'ah in language and bid'ah in sharia in the arabic language bid'ah is anything that was initiated without um a precedent but in sharia the only thing that is bid'ah is that which does not have any kind of support in sharia it doesn't mean it has to have been done and in fact it is impossible for the first three generations to have done every single thing that is good so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in the in the hadith uh in hadith man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasanatan falahu ajruha wa ajruma amila biha he who sets a good example in islam he who 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 sets a good sunnah in islam he has the reward of that sunnah and the reward of all those who copy him in in in, in that practice wa man sanna fil islami sunnatan sayyi'atan fa alayhi wizruha wa wizru man amila biha min ghayri an yuqsib al awzarihim shay and he who uh, sets a bad example a bad sunnah he has the reward of those who copy him who or he says the word of his of his act and the and those who copy him without their own sins be removed the the quran is filled with injunctions to do good wa fa'lu al khair la alakum tuflihun do good things so that you may uh uh this what hadith is this is hadith the hadith is man sanna fil islam you can find the hadith in arba'un hadith of nawawi if you just check man sanna fil islam sunnatan hasanatan i think is hadith of numan bin bashir man sanna fil islam sunnatan hasanatan falahu ajruha wa ajru man amila biha wa man sanna fil islam sunnatan sayyi'atan falahu wizruha wa wizru man amila biha okay the quran is filled with commands to do good man ja'a bil hasanati falahu ashru amthaliha he who does good gets a reward that is 10 times as good say so wa man yaktarif hasanatan uh nazil lahu fiha husna he he who does he who does a good thing we increase uh, the reward for him um in uh, over over what he has done wa fa'lu al-khayr la'alakum tuflihun go and do good good acts that you may uh, that you may prosper and you know we have to ask ourselves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself um the, we, we have a hadith of the prophet and trust in hadith of the prophet before i even come to the verse of the quran where he says and this is a hadith of abi darda where the prophet said um uh, ma ahalla allah fi kitabihi fa huwa halal wa ma harrama fi kitabihi fa huwa haram wa ma sakata anhu fa huwa af khudhu min allah af afiyata fa inna allaha lam yaqul li yansa shay'an and then he read the verse wa ma kana rabbuka nasiya he says that which allah has made lawful in his book is halal that which he has prohibited is haram but that which allah ha- was silent about okay is a mercy unto you it's a relief for you take this relief from allah because allah did not forget anything and he quotes this verse wa ma kana rabbuka nasiya your god is not forgot to forget for so even god even allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that if he does not prohibit anything no one can say it is haram it's not about he doesn't have to say do it if he has kept quiet about if he has not said anything about it it is awful in another hadith uh in uh, daru qudni the prophet says in allah farad faraida fala tadayuha wa hadda hududan fala ta'taduha wa harrama ashya fala tantaykuha wa taraka ashya rahmatan lakum min ghayri nisyan fala tabhathu anha he says allah has made some things obligatory do not neglect them he has set certain lines do not cross those lines he has made some things prohibited do not do them so these are three things then he says um 
wataraka ashya'a rahmatan lakum min ghairi nisyanin and he left many things as a mercy to you not because he has forgotten do not go and be searching for them and this is the same meaning in the quran where allah says ya ayyuhallazina la tas'alu an ashya'a in tubda lakum tasukum do not ask about things that were revealed for you will harm you so the prophet uh, so the the scholars of jurisprudence if you go to imam shafi'i uh, if you start with imam shafi'i he used to say that bid'ah a uh, bid'ah tani said there are two types of bid'ah bid'atul mahmuda or bid'atul madmuma an innovation that is praiseworthy and an innovation that is blameworthy the innovation that is praiseworthy is an innov- innovation that finds support in sharia that is consistent with sharia it is not possible for the prophet and his companions and those that come, that come after them in their lifetime to have done all the good deeds that the good deeds that a human being can do nobody who says that anything that they did not do is haram has any basis they can't give you a single hadith they can't give you a single verse of the quran on it all they can give you is that these are the best three generations and that is fine but from now to the day of judgment the opportunity exists for muslims to continue innovating good things that are consistent with sharia now when do you uh, depart from the sharia it's when you introduce things in your ibadah that do not have a basis in sharia so for example and 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 there's a hadith uh, where where allah says uh, my servant does not worship me with anything that is better than that which i have made obligatory upon him and then he says my servant continues getting close to be with nawafil okay uh, with with supererogatory acts until i love him you know that hadith is well known laiza lu abdi yataqarrabu ilayhi bin nawafil hatta uhibbahu faida ahabbtuhu kuntu sam and then he says when i love him i become his hearing that he hears with i become his sight that he sees with i become his hands that he touches with i become his feet that he walks with when he calls me i answer him when he asks me i i um i give him when he comes to me walking i come to him running that hadith is is well known is that is it's a hadith god see that begins with man ajani wadiya fa adan tu bil harb he who um um is an enemy to those who love me i'm also at war with him now when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us uh aqimu salah pray and he writes five daily prayers we know automatically that allah loves salah after you brought your five daily prayers um any salah you do that is nafila you know you are doing to allah what allah loves okay i'm getting close to allah uh which is why uh, i don't know whether we all know that this prayer that you see in saudi arabia every day in makkah if you apply their own rules to them it's all bidah because there was never a time in the salaf where they used to pray tarawih go and sleep and come back and pray uh, tahajjud in jamaah in fact the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam only prayed the night prayer once he either he either prayed before going to bed or he would sleep and wake up and pray before fajr or mean it's 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 one prayer but this idea of you have tarawih and you have tahajjud if you apply their rules it is bidah if if at the beginning of bringing people together uh, to pray in tarawih when omar started it he said ni'mat bid'atun hadi he said this is a very beautiful bid'ah he was one the prophet never in his lifetime said let us come and be praying tarawih together in jamaah every every day not to talk of um it, it, uh, reading the entire quran in prayer during the month of ramadan but the, but nobody would say this is a bad bid'ah even though the salaf did not do it and and so this is what, just one example of the kinds of things that we do okay even when they, when they sit down and uh, they if you in, in now in your bible land or in hausa land or in uh, ibo land you have uh, someone reading the quran and there's somebody translating into a language in the month of these are all technically innovations but there is nothing there's nothing wrong uh, with them because they have a basis in the in uh, in the sharia it's about uh, teaching the religion about teaching the quran about explaining explain the quran um so when you pray uh, your um, nafila no matter what is nobody can tell you it is bid abdalala if you allah says we should fast in ramadan 
after Ramadan, if you choose to fast, uh, Nafila, nobody says it is bitter. Even uh, so long as you do not fast on the days where you are prohibited to fast. Allah says you should give zakah. So we know that Allah wants us to give money to the poor. Anything you give after that is sadaqah. And it is part of the nafida that Allah SWT accepts. Allah says you should do hajj. When you now go for umrah several times, it is again nafila. Now, the same thing. Allah says, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Do your salat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you keep, um, if you say you're going to say salat 100 times or 200 times or 300 times or whatever, whether as an individual or as a group, this is again um, uh, nafila. He says, wa thkurullaha kathira. I remember Allah um, a lot. If you go, if you sit down and do la ilaha illallah, it, nobody can tell it is bitter. He says, istaghfiru, istaghfiru, thumma tubu ilayhi. Seek God's forgiveness. If you sit down and you do istighfar, istighfar, that again is not bitter. So this idea that anything that was not done by the salaf in the form of the bidya is something that is held by a minority of scholars, which contradicts, if you look at Imam al we look at Ibn Hajar, if you look at Imam Shafi'i, if you look at Sultan al-Ulama, is the of the Salam, if you look at Ibn Arabi, there are tens and tens of sources of scholars that have never held this view. Now, so uh, I think the first thing for all of us who worship Allah is to, uh, is to try and base our understanding on the correct understanding of what is the Sunnah. So, so long as what you are doing is something that has a foundation uh, in uh, the uh, uh, in, in in the Sunnah, Ibadah the Sunnah, uh, that, then it is not bidah. Now, however, if you worship Allah with something that has no basis, you decide you are going to be clapping and dancing and uh, uh, whistling, for example, and say this is ibadah, this is a bidah muharramah. But if it's with something that Allah himself has indicated that he loves, like prayer, like fasting, like um, giving out of your wealth, like dhikr, like a, a salah uh, on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like um, tasbih, like tahmid, none of that is there. Somebody says it's tariqah, it could be there. Yes, at, uh, if, 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 if the tariqah tariqa, tariqa or sufism, it can be good or bad. If what you have in the tariqah, if your awrad, if your uh, uh, if your dhikr is consistent with um, uh, with the awrad of, of the of, of the sharia, it is good. If you if if the tariqah tells you to to say la ilaha illallah, to say Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad, to say astaghfirullah, there can be nothing wrong with it. Now, if you have other things that are put in, you weigh each and every one. For example, in Tijani, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani says. Whatever you are told from me, weigh it against the scale of the Sharia. If it is consistent, you take it. If it's not consistent, it's not from me. You, nobody who joins a tariqah is obliged to accept everything he is told, except it is consistent with the Sharia. And this is the whole idea. So uh, these kinds of um, uh, understandings are things that we need to, we need to, to, um, to clarify. So two things, ikhlas, very important. And, and, and uh, now that Tariqah is coming, that, that's really um, what's about the Ihsan. It's about purification of the soul. The Prophet was asked about what is Ihsan. He said, That you worship Allah as if you see him. If you do not see him, he sees you. Now, many of us pay too much attention. And there's nothing wrong with it. We pay too much attention on the, um, on, on, on the external part of worship and too little attention to the internal uh, for, uh, part of worship. What your soul does, what your heart does is much more important than your body. The prophet says um, in, in, um, in a hadith, um, when uh, he says um, in the body there is a, a, a piece of flesh. If it is good, the body is good. If it is, if it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. And he says, this is the heart. He says, Allah does not look at your bodies or your forms. He looks at your heart. And uh, so part of ibadah is to ask ourselves, what, are the, what is the ibadah of the heart? Okay, we've talked about ikhlas. You've got things like muhabba. These are things that are obligatory on the heart, on, 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 our, on our hearts. The love for Allah. 
the um, uh, sincerity towards Allah in, in, in our deeds, our love for Allah, our reliance on Allah, tawakkul, okay, our perseverance in the face of doing what He has commanded us to do and what He has protected from us. These are obligatory. The, the heart has a badder of its own, okay. Just as the body has a body of its own, there are things on the heart that are wajib, the obligatory. There are things on the heart that are haram. For example, uh, riya, uh, when when you when you when you do things uh, uh, for ostentation or or arrogance, or, or or hatred or lack of gratitude, these are all haram. There are things, uh, and and what is haram on the heart can be kufr, it can be a sin. For example, if if it's uh, if it's shirk, if it's nifak. Uh, it is it is kufr, uh, uh, or if it is arrogance, um, it is um, uh, it is um, it it is it is a great sin. So there are things on on the heart that are obligatory. There are things on the heart that that are recommended, such as um, the dispute over rida, for example. Um, when 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 you are faced with a calamity, are you um, is rida um, being pleased with it? Is that um, necessary is that um is that obligatory or is it recommended accepting it okay uh, there, there, there is a dispute over that but i don't want to go into all those details um actually um in the matter of of imam ahmed but the point is the heart has the things that are um obligatory on the heart things that are, that are recommended on the heart things that are haram for the heart things that are more for the heart just like you have them externally and we need to pay attention to all those things a lot of the time people Pay too much, pay all that, spend all that time. They know how to do their wudu, they know how to do their salat, they know how to do their fasting, but then they do not take care of the heart. And this is why the Prophet says things like, He who is fasting but does not um, leave um, uh, any kind of um, confrontation or discord, that God has no uh, need for your hunger. In other words, uh, the whole purpose of fasting is that you're close to God. And if you do not do that, then there's no point just keeping yourself um, hungry. So, so it's very important that we look at um, the um, the worship of the heart um, and the, the worship of the tongue, what we say, what is wajib on the tongue. Uh, the prophet said, um, nothing throws us headlong into hellfire um, like our tongue. So what we say, the kalima shahada is wajib. Reading the Quran in prayer is wajib. Okay, um, calling uh, on the good, Amr bin Ma'aruf and Munkar, calling on what is good and uh, prohibiting what is bad is a wajib, it's obligatory. Okay, uh, saying there are things that with our tongue we should not say because they are haram. Okay, um, things that are sinful, things that are a disbelief, things that support um, a disbelief, uh, and so on. There, there's also the worship of the limbs, of course. Although that's that we all know. Uh, you, you, you don't drink. You don't uh, commit sinna. You, you, you don't gamble, and so on. Uh, this we know. So we, we, we spend more time. We, we know all. We know the fiqh, but we also need to know um, uh, that which concerns the tongue and that which concerns the heart. Uh, so finally, I would just say um, a final dimension of ibadah that um, for for those who decide that they are servants of Allah and for those who love Allah and who do his work um, you've got different levels uh, and 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 sort of walk here comes with them talks about ashabul maimana and then talks about ashabikun uh, ashabikun you talk about those on, on, on the right hand and then those who have gone ahead those who are who are close and the difference really is again on their level of commitment so those who are um, or on the right, on the right hand, they generally do all that is obligatory, avoid what is haram, do some things that are recommended, um, and spend a lot of time on that which is permissible. Uh, for those who are close to Allah, um, they bring, they do that which is obligatory, and then they bring on all a lot of supererogatory acts that have not been imposed upon them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but out of those things that Allah loves. So you find them always, whether it's in uh, uh, night prayer, whether it's in regular fasting, whether it's in giving regular charity, it is in uh, um, giving knowledge, it's in, in, in 
halakat and zikr, where they do the zikr and the istighfar and the salat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They avoid not just haram, but they avoid things that are makroh, things that are not sinful, but that are not recommended. And that's how they get close and close and close and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you talk about understanding the religion of Allah, the deen, we should understand deen in two forms. Understand the deen in terms of its being um, a, a command and a path, and um, a deen al-amri shari. We should also understand the deen in the in, in the sense of deen being compensation. When 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 in Fatih Allah says Malik Yomi Deen, the master of the day of judgment, deen is actually the day of compensation. So and understanding those things that give you the highest rewards and doing them is important. I'll give you a simple example. Um, uh, what is take the mubah? The mubah in, in, in fiqh is that which is permissible. Okay, it is something that when you do it, there is no reward. When you don't do it, there is no sin. So it, it is um, you, you, it's neutral. Okay, it's not a sin, it's not a reward. However, it takes a simple thing like eating food. When you eat food, it's not an act of worship. But these people that you talk about as sabibun and sabibun, when they eat, they eat food so that they have the strength to worship Allah. When they sleep, they sleep so that they are able to wake up in the night and pray. Now that niya, just that intention, that I'm going to sleep for three, four hours so that I can stand up and pray for the, for the following a few hours in the night, that intention turns the sleep into an act of worship and, 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 and or, or, or eating into an act of worship. So ibadah, okay, can be moved from what is just mubah to what is mandub, to, to something that's, uh, that is rewarding with the niya. So these are the kinds of things that, um, uh, that, that the nuances of ibadah that we need to, to take care of so that we profit uh, in this world. And finally, we must remember that this is the world in which you do ibadah. Uh, after you're dead, uh, there's nothing left. Of course, there will, be, there will still be a few uh, um, um, ibadahs that are compulsory, but then your success in those ibadah depends on how successful you are in this world. And I say that, that Ibadah after death, for example, because when you die, uh, the angels, Nekir and Munkar, are going to ask you questions. And you have to answer. That's, that's, that's also Ibadah. You have to answer. They're going to ask you, who was your Lord? Who did you worship? They would ask you, who was your prophet? They would ask you, what is your religion? And if you don't answer correctly, uh, you, ha you have, and all you can answer correctly is to have done the right thing in your lifetime. Even when we all rise up before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we stand before Allah, we will be asked. That is, there's still ibadah because Yomah Yuksha for Ansakin, for Yud Aun Eda Sujud, if Allah is of the own. We will be asked to do our sujud on that day. And those who have not uh, given themselves to Allah, those who have not uh, worshipped Allah, have not humbled themselves before Allah in this world, will not be able on that day to do that sujud. For lives of their own, they will not be able to do that. That is their punishment. So uh, the way to ensure that um, in our graves we have peace, because if you don't answer those questions properly in your grave, your grave becomes, um, um, you start getting punishment from your grave. The Prophet said your grave is either a garden among the gardens of Jannah or one of the pits of the pits of hell. So... You, that is the difference. So, and the only way you can make sure that your grave is a garden of Jannah and not a pit of hell is to make sure that you purify your ibadah in this world and you do it according to the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, as understood um, uh, properly, uh, not uh, in the form uh, that is being presented without any kind of justification. So, um, as usual with these. Um, kinds of conversations, um, one, one speaks almost in a vacuum because one doesn't know exactly what the audience wants to hear or what the audience wants to discuss. So it's always better to leave time for people to ask questions and then let the questions lead us to, to shed in uh, greater light um, on, uh, on, on the themes, uh, bidnillah.
اقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك thank you thank you thank you very much um from so many perspectives and the more we engage in this conversation the deeper we can we can only get uh i pray that allah continues to uh, expand your your heart your chest for you so that um we can have you to come and raise some of these questions um even from the basic understanding somebody is on on their way to umrah so i'm off to for umrah and people say oh may allah accept it as ibadah you know uh, from those basic use of um, ibadah we've we've come to see the reason why we pray that allah, allah accepts it as an act of um, act of ibadah act of worship act of um a a slave that is attempting to please the master uh, uh context and we thank you for for the time that you spent at the very beginning trying to um explain to what uh what does it really mean when you say that you worship Allah you know what what uh, and you went into uh, uh significant details you know the meaning of ibad you know lower in comparison to to the other and in this case that other can only be allah um uh, how how low can i get because allah is um right right up there uh it, it's not easy for me a, a non scholar to want to uh explain but i'm just i just reflect my own interpretations what i'm able to get out of it in the knowledge that there are so many people like me also on the platform who can live with the with the basic we are all servants and slaves of allah no nobody has been elevated to to the status of a partner with 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 allah no we are all we are all servants we, we may even, even have degrees of servanthood amongst ourselves servants but none none to have risen beyond being a servant uh, 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 of allah and we should if that is the minimum we take away from here and we take away into our grave i think that um, the, the 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 punishment of the grave will be less severe uh, far less severe than if we feel that there was a slave that um, uh, occupies the same the same level as uh, allah um and uh, what what is ibadah really two components the most extreme humility the most extreme humility before allah how how small can we make ourselves before our creator <coughs> but alongside that the most love for allah the the, the, the is like a coin really from uh, uh what i heard from the speaker uh one side is the most extreme humility and the other side is the most love for for allah um that is what we have to achieve for us to then be able to use the word easily uh, may may be an act of worship may allah accept it as a bada from you uh two ingredients is purely for allah not for anything else we are doing it for allah's sake for allah's favor for allah's pleasure and two you must follow you must follow the the sunnah um we look at our deen primarily i mean in in two forms in 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 rounding all these all one as a command this is what you need to do um this is what you must do for you to say that you have observed the deen as as prescribed but also as compensation um uh, uh this is the day of judgment the day of reckoning judgment does not mean it's 11 hours uh, uh our lord sentencing us to hell no judgment is just a report you have um, 
you have done something, this is your report card. And in the reports that we have uh, received here on that, people have had A, A plus, and people have had F or E. Your, your reports will come out. That is the, that is the evaluation. Um, but in the knowledge that the Ibada uh, uh, can be moved by intention also, we can improve on, on, on the outcome of, 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 of this judgment. In other words, the, the intention behind that which we are doing, are we going on Umrah because we have the means to do so? Are we going on Umrah because it is fashionable to do so? Are we going on Umrah because that state governor that is so difficult to find in the state capital, in Umrah, because you are going to be staying at the Hilton together, you can actually catch him at the leaves and say, ah, your, your excellency, I'm a long distance to get to the Haram, but it's the governor that is next to you and there's no ADC or any policeman that is pushing you. Oh, or is it the Emir you want to see? He's uh, also just a, a worshiper, one single worshiper among other, other, other people. Uh, all your intention is, ah, did you see the governor yesterday? Oh, he was here. I didn't see him. I didn't. I didn't really come to see him. I went for for prayers. I went. I went for this. I went for that. Is it? Is it pure? Uh, it's all up to us. We continue to engage, uh, as the speaker uh, said in at the beginning. We continue to engage. We continue to learn. Um, and yesterday, just in, so in, in conclusion, I was discussing with my older brother who had just listened to a sermon, and um, we, we both concluded that our father's Islam was very simple, um, uncomplicated. His, his Nia was uh, clear that he was worshipping his God. While it is nice to know and engage in all these uh, 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 complications and so on and so forth, let her let the the subject they call the purification of the heart or the white heart clinic, you know, where we purify our heart. And um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, uh remove by himself, overlook some of the impurities uh that the technicalities uh, in other words, I am looking at the substance of Islam. Um, significantly over the form. Not that the form is irrelevant or is useless, but uh, what I have had today is for us to look at the substance more than we emphasize the, the, the form. May Allah bless the speaker. And if my understanding has, has been very poor compared to his intention of what I should learn, um, it will also reflect in my report uh, card. I will find time to go and learn more from him. Let me now go to the questions and answers that others on the, and comments that others on the platform have brought to us today. Um, we will take them maybe in threes. I will read the first three. Trials and tribulations are inevitable in life. When those come, our reaction is typically, why me? When we are in this situation of despondency, what else, in your own perspective, Khalifa, can we do apart from supplications and patience? That's number one. Number two, how do we distinguish between discretionary interpretations from the real intended meaning of the Quran? And the hadith of the prophet. What are the what guidelines can you give us in terms of in, in, in trying to distinguish between them? Number three, do we use Quran, the Quran to explain the hadith, or do we use the hadith to explain the Quran? Um, those are the first three. If you can, if you can start with those. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. You know, um, perseverance, patience, sabr is in fact one of the um, obligations on the heart. We talked about 
the YG batch, uh, well, that which is YG or, or compulsory. I will talk about that the heart has its own uh, YG batch, and 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 the and the YG one of the YGs of the heart is that uh, at the very least uh, we must persevere. We are all servants of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and Allah visits us uh, with things sometimes we like and sometimes that we don't like. Uh, but Allah loves us and he has a wisdom and a hikmah in whatever he does. Being able to recognize that and being able to see that whenever, I mean, Omar bin Khattab used to say that whenever I'm afflicted with an affliction, I think of three things. First thing I think about is it could have been worse. Okay, uh, so uh, you, you have a fire in your house and it burns your house or it burns a room in your house, and you're sad. But it could have burnt the whole house. It could have burnt your children. It could have burnt your wife. It could have burnt you. You could have, you could have gone. Okay, so the first thing is to recognize that it could have been worse. So you thank Allah for limiting it to where it, where it was. Secondly, we know from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when, when these things come, they are either kafara to live the loop, they are either um, a means of... Um, a, covering up some of your sins and, and, and basically dealing with them now so you don't answer for them later or elevating you uh, to, a, to a higher status uh, before Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and therefore you, you take that uh, with you and pray that um, with this um, affliction that your sins have been forgiven and that you're getting a reward and getting closer uh, to, Allah, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but most important, uh, you, you see, I always take this verse in the Quran where Allah says, Okay, you, you say to them, nothing afflicts us except that which God has prescribed for us. There's something interesting about Arabic language. Uh, when something is negative, it's bad. You don't use... Um, Lamb, you, you, you use Allah. So if you have, so even though you're talking about a bad thing, it says, Ma kachab Allah, Allah didn't say, Ma kachab Allah, okay? It says what God has, uh, has basically pre prescribed for us, not, what, not what, what God has prescribed against us. And the example I give to, to, to let people understand this is that sometimes, let, assume you had, um, gifts okay a very valuable gift of diamonds and jewelry and all that but then it's wrapped in a dirty and sinking towel and then given to you some people would accept this towel okay with all the stench uh persevere open it and when they open it they get this treasure that is hidden in it other people would take it and throw it away how you accept the decree of Allah is what determines whether in the end it will be good for you or bad. This is um, established and faith is established in practice. Whenever you are faced by a situation with Allah and Allah will always face us as human beings, Allah says, Allah says, that you know these things will happen to us. We will um, will will be faced uh, uh, be, with, with with things that frighten us. We'll be faced with deprivation. We'll be faced with with a lack, um, uh, with the loss of life, or the loss of limb, or the loss of health. We'll be faced. We are, we, that is the the nature of 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 humanity. But Allah says, "For wabashir sabirin, give glad tidings to those who persevere." Now, once uh, you are able to persevere, once you are able at that time to say, inna lillahi wa inna we belong to God and to him we will return. You know that this is from him and he is the one that knows why he did it and you're hoping that what he did is the best for you, it will be good for you. This is the only thing that, this is the difference, I think, between uh, uh, those who have faith and those who don't have faith. This is where you get your strength from your faith, knowing that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of your life and control of everything that happens to you. Nothing happens except by his will. And just the way he has afflicted you with um, something that, that is unpleasant, tomorrow 
he can take that away and give you something that is even more pleasing. And in fact, that unpleasantness may be the path to something much, much greater, but you had to go through that in order to get it. Um, the, the question of um, discretions in interpretation, the, the reality is that um, there's very little, I mean, every human being uh, comes to the Quran or the, or the Hadith with this level of knowledge. But um, as much as possible, uh, what, what we believe is that scholars are sincere in their attempt to try to explain what they believe was the intention of Allah and his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what Ijtihad is about, okay? It's about um, coming to, to, to the text, okay? With the residue of knowledge and capacity, not everybody can just go and interpret. They understand the language, they understand the Quran, they have read the Hadith, they have read scholars, and then they try to explain, okay, what to their best of, the best of their understanding is the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Shafi'i used to say that, I believe that my interpretation is correct, but I accept the possibility that it's wrong. And I believe your interpretation is wrong, but I accept that you may be correct. So, the, I mean, apart from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every scholar just does his best and they may be right and they may err. Uh, and our, our duty is to continue to examine what the scholars say, what is their logic, what was their rationale, and then and then wait. But being able to wait also requires certain knowledge to understand what what weight is given? What 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 what? Where are they coming from? Okay, what what may have influenced that judgment? Was it a hadith that they were not aware of? Was it the interpretation of another of a, of a hadith? I'll give an example. Okay, you have many verses in the Quran that talk about war. Okay, and and they talk about war with with non-believers, and you have had scholars who basically have interpreted that as a legitimate as a legitimation for you to to begin to begin to wage a war, but the Quran is very clear that the only time you're allowed to wage a war is in self-defense. And the, there are verses that give us those guidelines. The Quran says, uh, uh, wage war. Because, and I remember the Quran says, it doesn't, say, it doesn't say kill. It says wage war. So wage war means uh, two, uh, two different parties, okay? Or, 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 or two or more parties. It says, wage war against those, those who wage war against you. He says, Permission is granted to those on whom war has been waged that they can fight back. Okay, this Quran is very clear. It says, Allah does not prohibit you from having excellent relations and being good to those who have not waged war against you on account of your faith and who have not chased you out of your homes or persecuted you on account of your faith. So if you have Christians or Jews or even um, um, mushriks and idolaters, you don't have any reason, there's no basis in the Quran for you to wage war against them unless they attack you for your faith and persecute you for your faith. But you've had many scholars that interpreted um, this as ayah to say, as a permission to go and wage a war. Okay, and now that is a wrong interpretation, but you, you pray for them that Allah SWT forgive them. And those some of those interpretations have been the cause of some of the problems that we are facing today, where you have some Muslims take up arms against innocent people, because I, uh, some of the, in fact, sometimes against Muslims who do not agree with the interpretation of Islam, okay, and then attack non-Muslims, for example, and believe that they're waging a jihad, non-Muslims who have done nothing to them, non-Muslims who have lived peacefully with them, non-Muslims who have never attacked them or chased them out of their homes or persecuted them. The Prophet ﷺ was persecuted. He was chased out of his home. They, they, his, he and his companions, they lost their property. And they were attacked even when they went to Medina. Okay? And, and, they, were, and they were then given permission to fight back. They were given permission because they were expelled from their homes for no offense, except that they, say, they said, our Lord is Allah. So, the, so sometimes you have these interpretations, and the, and it's not that they that they are arbitrary, okay? It is uh, just that they're human beings, and sometimes they may miss something or they may not do not deal with context. Which brings me to the last question: the Quran and the Hadith are together. Hadith explains the Quran. The Quran explains the Hadith because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the message, 
and the prophet does not speak of his own accord. He does not speak out of his vain desire. What he says is what is revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are times you see a verse in the Quran and to understand it, you go to the hadith because the prophet has explained it. Just see a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you read it, the context of what the Quran says. Okay? The Quran also interprets the Quran, like the examples I've given with the, with the, with the verses on, on war. Yes, where you see a verse that says you, you wage a war, you also see all the verses that tell you who you should be waging a war against. And these are people who have waged a war against you on account of your faith, who have broken their covenant, who have expelled you from your homes. But if a non-Muslim is kind to you, a non-Muslim is uh, friendly to you, a non-Muslim has not oppressed you, Allah says, لَا يَنْحَاكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقْسِطُوا عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْسِطِينَ Allah does not prohibit you from those who have not fought you on account of your faith, who have not expelled you from your homes, Allah does not prohibit you from being kind to them and from being just with them. Allah loves those who are, who are just in kindness. Allah only prohibits you uh, from being allies with those who have waged war against you on account of your faith or chased you out of your homes or assisted those who chased you out of your homes. So um, this, uh, this is the Quran interpreting the Quran. You cannot, in the presence of this verse, uh, on the verse that says, La ikraha fiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. Very, very clear. There is no compulsion. You cannot, on the basis of, with all these verses of the Quran, justify taking up arms to fight somebody, either to convert him to uh, Islam or to, uh, or, or because he is not, he is not a Muslim. So um, basically the Quran uh, interprets the Quran, the Hadith interprets the Quran, the Quran interprets Hadith and uh, is you cannot separate because you are supposed to, uh, Allah says, Ma atakum rasulu wa man haakum anhu fantahu. That which the prophet, which the prophet comes with uh, to you, take it, and that which he prohibits you from, uh, avoid it. So uh, what the prophet says is what man ata man man yute rasula fakarata Allah. He who follows the prophet has followed Allah subhanahu wa taala. So you can't separate the two. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. The next set of three questions. It's a Jude in congregation leader. Uh, this will depend on when the person joined the platform because you you explained this uh, profusely, but it's a question. Is doing a Lailatu Kodri in congregation leader? In the context, the next one, in the context of good innovation, where do we place prescriptions of prayer that require repetition? That require repetition. Certain prayers numerous times. As for example, Istighfar, Asagafullah, I do it a million times or do it half a million times. How do we place all these? Let me make this one, this set for if we say that any worship with basis in Sharia is good. Can we now fast without breaking it continuously? Continuously, or what is called white fasting is sunnah, hasana. Those are the four. It's good sunnah, essentially. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, on 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 tahajjud or little bit that's what you know. You know, a bid'a um has to, uh, there are two senses of bid'a innovation. There's a linguistic sense which is that this is something that is done without a precedent. So, um, uh, uh, for example, we say, Allahu yubdi'ul khalqa thumma yu'idu. God um, initiated creation. Okay, so, uh, he, I mean, there was no, nobody created anything before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah was one who innovated creation. He was, he was one who, who started it. Okay, so uh, th that is in language. But then there's a meaning in sharia, which is the, which is the bid'a that is prohibited. And when you, so tahajjud in a congregation is a bit uh, linguistically in the sense that there is no history of the prophet or the companions doing this, okay? Or the tabin or the about, about tabin. There is no history of that. Even though there, uh, there was a history of, in the time of Omar, um, taraweh being done. 
but um after that but this one where you do tarawi and it, it in terms of language it is an innovation but it is not a, an innovation in sharia because praying in the night is sunnah a praying nafila in jama'ah is also sunnah so if you decide to do it every night of ramadan if you decide to read every uh, just of the quran um in in the prayer Nobody can tell you this is an undesirable bid'ah. Nobody can tell you this is a bid'ah in Sharia, but it's a bid'ah linguistically. Now, the example I was given, I was given that example specifically to say that the people that will tell you that anything you do that was not done by the prophet and by the companions and by the chairman at Ba'u Tabi'in, anything that you do that is, was not done by them is bid'ah, they should explain to you where they found in, in, in those three generations that people used to gather together uh, after, uh, to come and do uh, and do tahajjud, so I, I will not. Call, I would call it sunnah, even if it was not done by them, because it is in fact it is prayer, and 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 Allah prescribes prayer. Allah pr- prescribes nawafil. Allah and um, the sunnah allows saying the naf- nafila in congregation. So there is nothing in the act that contradicts um, a sunnah. And this is the and this is why I say we need to understand what is in fact bidya. Bid'ah has to be something that contradicts um, something that is in Sharia, and and and, and the same goes for for your um, for the third question. If you are told if you want to if you're doing istighfar a certain number of times, what is the, what are you doing? You are still doing istighfar, and Allah says, um, uh, uh, "Quoting No, Ayakom is Tagfiru Rabbakum in Hukana Gafara." Seek Allah's forgiveness. Um, uh, 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 God, God is all forgiven. Allah says, Return to your God in repentance and then seek his forgiveness. Uh, it says, Is sakfiru rabbakum. Seek the forgiveness um, uh, uh, of Allah. So if you are you are basically carrying out the command of Allah by saying, As-sakfirullah, As-sakfirullah al-adhim, As-sakfirullah al-adhim, you want to say it 50 times, 100 times, 200 times, 1,000 times, a million times, you are still carrying out the instruction of Allah. It cannot. It is. It is. It has a basis um, in the Sharia. Uh, fasting without breaking it contradicts the Sunnah. It contradicts the Sunnah. That's what I said. If it if it contradicts the Sunnah, it is not Sunnah. The uh, uh, the Quran is the, the Quran is even clear. It says, uh, uh, Allah says, eat and drink until you see the Fajr. And then you complete your fast until sunset. And the Prophet has defined for us in the late of the night to be this, the setting of the sun as Maghrib. And that is Sunnah. And the Prophet has explicitly prohibited Muslims from refusing to break their fast and continuing uh, one fast. And you see, the, the Prophet says, that which I command you, come and do it to the best of your ability. That which I prohibit you from doing, make sure you stop it. And the point I'm making uh, in, in, the, in, in this lecture is there's a difference between prohibiting something and not doing something. He says, what I told you not to do. He didn't say, he didn't say what I did not do. There are many things that the prophet did not do, but that even the companions did. Okay, There are things the prophet did not eat, but they're not haram. The prophet didn't eat garlic. He didn't like it, but he never said it was haram. And, and it is standard in jurisprudence that the fact that the prophet does not do something does not make it haram unless he said it is haram, unless he says it should not be done. So uh, you cannot fast without breaking a fast because doing that is going against the um, directive of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you should not add one fast to the other. It is not holiness and therefore it is a violation of the sunnah. Please, yeah, thank you very much. Um, the next set. Is it haram to pray both tarawi and tajud in the same night? Again, um, 
maybe the questioner came in later. Mm -hmm. I missed that point, but it's still a question. What is internal part? Yeah. What is internal part of worship? And what is the external part of worship? Number three, is there no standard to identify good or bad bidder from Ali from Ali Salah? Shouldn't it be safe to avoid it completely? Number four, and the final one in this batch, on the on the demise of a Muslim, when a Muslim dies. Prayers are offered for his or her soul on the third, on the seventh, and on the fortieth day after burial by some Muslims in Ghana. This particular question is coming from Ghana. Does this practice constitute bida? Those are the four questions in this set. Bismillah. Okay. Um, I think the first question is very clear. I have I have never said I have not said that uh, praying Taraweeh and Tahajjud are haram. I'm saying that uh, what I said is that this idea that you pray Taraweeh, uh, what we see in Saudi Arabia, you pray Taraweeh, uh, and then you sleep, then you come and pray Tahajjud. That this was not done by the Salaf. And if you apply the rules that the Salafis have, you would say this is a bidah, and you would you would condemn it. But we don't condemn it. Because it is a prayer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It is um, keeping the keep, uh, keeping the nights of Ramadan alive. It is worshiping. Uh, it is uh, it is Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan. It is all consistent with the Sunnah. But there but there is no record at all of uh, of the Prophet having done this, or the companions having done this, or the Tabi'in having done this, or that about Tabi'in um, having, having having done this. Um, so so. I'm saying that there are certain, there's so many inconsistencies in the manner in which they have defined bidia. There's so many things that they do that if you were to apply their rules are also are also bidia. So it's uh, what is important uh, is to go back to the correct understanding of bidia, which is that which is done in violation um, of uh, the Sharia, that which is done that has no support at all um, in the Sharia. And the question on internal and external. You look, in, in, in all our deeds, there's an external part and there's an internal part. Okay? When, when you stand up and you're praying and you're saying your salah and you go Allah Akbar and you're reading the Fatiha and the Surah, this is all external. Especially when, when you're reading the Fatiha Allah and saying Surah. We don't know what is going on inside your heart. You could be praying Zuhur, for example, and you're thinking of a football match between Arsenal and Manchester United. Okay? We can only see the external part. Allah looks at the internal part. If in that prayer, and this is the Prophet said that there is some of you who will pray, and you have nothing in your prayer but um, one tenth of the prayer, but but half of the prayer, or a quarter of the prayer, or one sixth of the prayer, or one tenth of it. And in fact, there's some that will, that will get nothing but just one sajda or or a few seconds. The amount of what is recorded for you with Allah in your prayer is the proportion of that prayer that is with Allah, where your heart is with God. It, 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 is, it is that in your heart that is what goes with God. That is what goes with God. The external thing, we all, and, and that's why in, in, in terms of fields of knowledge, fiqh deals with the external. It tells you how to do your wudu, it tells you how to pray, it tells you how to fast, it tells you how to do your hajj, it tells you how to do zakah, you know, it tells you how to get married. It tells you what um, invalidates these things and what makes them good. Okay? Tasawwuf deals with your heart. Because the Prophet says, Anta Allah ka anna tarah, That you worship Allah as if you see him. Because if you do not see him, he sees you. Now, the only way you can do that is to purify your heart. To make sure that when you stand before Allah, you know that you're standing before God. When you come to pray, do you know you're standing before your God? And, you know, coming back to our point of ibadah being love, the Prophet used to say, the, 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 the gentleness in my eyes, the tenderness of my soul is in prayer. Why? Because when he goes to pray, he's going to the God that he loves. He's going to communicate, he's going to communion with his Lord. And that's a communion that is filled with love. He's happy. 
He doesn't see prayer as a burden. Some of us see it as a burden self of prayer. Let us go and offload this body because we don't do it, you're going to be punished. Okay? The prophet looks, looks forward from one prayer to the next, which is why among the people that are going to be the, the seven people that will be and, and, and that'll be sh under the shade of Allah, there, there's no shade. He measures those whose hearts are tied to the masjid. When they leave uh, one prayer, their hearts are with the masjid until the next prayer. Okay, so um, the, the, that internal feeling, okay, the, the, the fear of Allah, the love of Allah, the dependence on Allah, that is, those are the internal uh, uh, dimensions, the inner dimensions of, of Muslim worship. And, and then you've got the external. The external has to be done um, the way it was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all, we, we all do that externally. We all, you, look, you can have 100 people in the, in the mosque. They're praying and they, they, their prayer is of different levels of acceptance because one is filled with the fear of Allah and the love of Allah and his concentration is on Allah. The other is thinking about his financial transaction. Externally, we're doing the same thing. Internally, we're doing something different. That is the difference. I hope I'm making myself clear. So that is the, the you have an inner dimension and an outer dimension. We're all fasting. We don't eat from uh, Fajr to Maghrib. But there are people who just do that. There are people who spend the whole day, um, they're reading the Quran. They're thinking of Allah. They are actually repenting for their sins. They're thinking of what they've done wrong. They're planning how they can do other, how, how, how they can do other good deeds. There is no way you're going to compare that. That in the inner, that uh, and, and and this is the purpose of of fasting. It's like Allah kum that you that you that you fear Allah. So those who strive to get, to build their taqwa are those who understand the real purpose and the hikmah of fasting. It is not just about not eating. Uh, God does not benefit anything from you not eating. If you whether you eat the uh, uh, you eat or do not eat, that does not affect God. What he wants is that closeness from your heart. Take this one month in the year. Okay? Get that closeness. Think about what you've done in the last 11 months. Seek forgiveness. Ask him to forgive you. Get close to him. Promise that for the next um, uh, uh, 12, for the rest of your life, you are going to be a better person than you were in the past. And then he's and then he welcomes you and he's happy with what you, you've done and he forgives you. So th 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 there's a, this distinction between in, uh, internal and external. Good, um, um, but, but be, I, I mean, uh, like Imam Shafi, he said, there's been bid'ah to Mahmoud and bid'ah to Madmuma. I mean, we all know what is good. You, and we know what is bad. Uh, God has given us fitrah. God has given us nature. And we have the Quran and the Hadith as a guide. There is no way anybody can tell you that reading the Quran is bad. Or saying istighfar is bad. Or saying salat uh, on the Prophet Sallallahu is bad. Nobody. If you, if, you do, if you say you're going to have more loot, for example, and what, what, and what do you mean by more loot? On that particular day, you're sitting down, you're reading the Quran, you're teaching people about the love of the Prophet, you're teaching about the history of the Prophet, talking about his miracles, encouraging the young people, taking him as an example. Nobody can tell me it is bidia that is bad, even if the Salaf have not done it. But if you have a more loot, where you have men and women uh, dressed improperly, dancing and singing, you know, um, uh, eating and drinking and maybe doing bad things. That is a bad bidia. Even if you say it is celebrating the Prophet's birthday, do you celebrate the Prophet's birthday by doing things that he prohibited? By doing things that are against his sunnah? But if you are, if you choose that day, and that day is a day you're choosing to remind people about his sunnah, about him. Remember that Allah sent him as a mercy to us. He said, We do not send yourself as a mercy to mankind. He says, Say that with the, with the bounties of Allah and His mercy, these are things you should be proud of, you should be, you should be happy about. If you decide that you're going to do that, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, but you cannot tell people who do not do Mawlud that their Islam is not complete. You cannot. And those who do not do cannot tell you that it's haram. They look at what you do. If at this what even half even Rajab said that Maulud is bid'ah because it was not done by the Salaf. However, you cannot make a ruling on whether it is good or bad. You rule on what they do in the Maulud. If what they do is good acts, reading the Quran, teaching people about the love of the Prophet, then it is good. If what they do is bad, then it is bad. As and that is that's the rule. Um 
price on the third, seventh, fortieth day, these are all bid'ah in the sense that there is no. Um, in fact, the the prophet asks us to mourn for three days, or, okay, or to or to, and, and and then after that go on. Um, my own advice to people is that when people are dead, you pray for them every day. This idea of giving, I mean, we're supposed to pray for them every day. We pray for our parents every day. May God forgive them. May God, uh, so, and, and, and may we take this opportunity to pray again for all our parents who have, who have gone. May Allah take them in, in Al-Jannah. And may Allah join us with them um, together in Al-Jannah. But, but honestly, um, and especially when you find that when you do these prayers, they are like parties. On the seventh day, you come, you cook food, you sit down, you have a party. On the 40th day, you come, you hold. At the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with praying for a dead person, but it has become a religion. And people even think that if you don't do it, then you do not love the dead. This is where the bidah comes in. This is where it becomes discouraged. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think uh, since the prophet is very clear, three days, do the three days and disperse. And then wherever you are, you continue praying for them. I think those are the four questions. Um, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Uh, I differ with his opinion on the hadith prohibiting engagement in Bida in Bida. Hadith of Aisha Radio Anu. Whoever introduces anything into a religion, what was never part of it in the first place, it will be thrown back at him. Exactly. Or whoever engages in an act of worship in which there is no permission of Allah and his Rasul, such will be regretted, or such, such will be rejected. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, is a boss permitted to give zakat, zakat to fitri, to domestic aids, with intention or instruction that they send some of their poorer parents back home. Number, number three, could you relate Ibadah to social order, please? And number four, what are the common misconceptions about Ibadah and how can they be addressed? Also, how does the understanding of Ibadah evolve over a person's lifetime and in different stages of spiritual development? Thank you. We'll take this four. Okay, thank you. I, I'm actually going to look for a book, but I'll do it before uh, we leave. Okay, so on the Hadith of Aisha, the Hadith of Aisha is very, is very, very interesting. What does the Hadith say? Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. He who innovates in this, our religion, that which is not part of it. Ma laysa minhu. This is what I've been saying all day. That if it has a basis in the Sharia, it is not bidah. If you say somebody is doing istighfar and you say um, the um, if he does istighfar a hundred times and you say all oh, that yeah, there is no or, or a thousand times or five hundred times and you say this is a new thing, how how does istighfar become new? How does uh, the, the how does saying salah on on the prophet become new? How does uh, putting lights in the masjid, using loudspeakers. How is that not part of the religion? Is it not part of beautif beautifying a mosque? The Prophet never had um, all these uh, lights and loudspeakers and uh, all these beautiful carpets we have, you know, but we are expected to. But there's a general instruction for a marathon masjid, which is uh, given, given the mosque's life. And Imaratul Masjid is building the mosque, is beautifying the mosque, it is purifying the mosque, it is cleaning the mosque. It is making the, the mosque alive by making sure that 
you pray there, you teach there, you do dhikr there, you read the Quran there. So the, the hadith of Aisha is very clear. It says, Ma laysa minhu. It, it didn't just say, he who starts something. It says, he who starts something in this religion that is not in it. Ma laysa minhu. And I think, the, and, and it's the same thing with man, uh, with Okullam who does in uh, Bida. And that's why it's extremely important um, to read the commentary. If you go to Imam al Nawawi, I mean, he, that is the most famous commentary on, uh, on the hadith of Muslim. You read the commentary on that hadith and see what Imam Nawi says. The book I was looking for, yeah, it's, it's a book I have, it's called Itqan it Sun'ah, Fita Iman al Bid'ah. It gives you the quotes from Imam al Nawi, from Ibn Hajar in, 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 um, in Fatul Bari. Why do we read these hadith and not read the commentaries on the hadith? Imam al Nawi takes the hadith, Man sanna fil Islam sunnatan hasanatan. He who begins in Islam a good sunnah. And he says this hadith is a hadith that shows that there are exceptions to all those hadiths that are that you're quoting. Things like Manja Afi Amrina Malay Saminhu, Man Hadafi Amrina Malay Saminhu, for what Aisha's hadith, or the hadith Man Mukulla Mudafatin Bidia, or Kul Bidatin Dalala. He says this hadith, Man Sanafil Islami, is a muhassis. It is a hadith that gives an exception in Usul al Fiqh. You have what is called, uh, you have an arm, a general, a general statement, and then you have taxis. Taxis takes out exceptions. And there are many examples in, um, in, in the Quran, uh, uh, the uh, taxis of Quran by Quran, taxis of Quran by hadith, taxis of hadith by Quran, and so on. And I don't want to, we can go into all of that, but this is all known to students of Usul al-Fiqh. Imam Nawi says this, uh, this taxis, it says that you can, you can actually begin to, to do, you can, do, you can initiate good deeds, but you cannot initiate anything that is contradictory to the Sharia. It must have some witness uh, in some general rule, general, you know, uh, just like we've said about masjid, anything you do to, to beautify and purify the, the mosque is under the general rule of Imarat al-Masjid. Anything you do to be kind to your parents or your mother, um, even if it was not done by the prophet, if it was not done by the companions, is under Birr al There are so many general principles of, 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 that's why the Quran is a universal book forever. If you tell me that every single thing that is good has been done by those three generations, I tell you it is impossible. They are human beings. They are 24 hours a day. In any case, in every society and every time, things happen. And I'll give you one example that I gave recently when I was giving a lecture. Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin nas. You are the best of mankind. You have been set up as a role mod model for mankind. You command that which is good, you prohibit that which is evil, and you believe in Allah. You have in this time, in places like Mauritania, you have people who will tell you that under Islamic law, you can own slaves. You can sell slaves. You can have concubines. And it is true. It was like that in the 7th century, in the in 12th and 13th century. The entire world was a world where people owned slaves. And yes, um, um, Islamic law treated slaves better than uh, slaves who have been treated in, in, in other societies. Okay? Even uh, the rules were even different. If you have a concubine and she has a child, he, he's your son. He's not a slave. Whereas in other societies, if, you, if, the, if the mother is a slave, even if it's your child, you have given birth to a slave, and so on. Islam was a gold standard at that time. Will anybody, does anybody think he's doing service to Islam in the 21st century by arguing that Islam allows you to have slaves? Because the Salaf did not prohibit slavery because they own slaves. Therefore, we should own slaves in a world in which it is seen as negative, as adverse, and the world has advanced to a point where, which is, the, the equality of all human beings before Allah has been recognized. You know, the, the, the standards will change. What was a gold standard in, in the 13th century is not a gold standard in the 21st century. We as Muslims in this century should be an example for the people of the 21st century to look up to. Even if this has not been done in the past. So this restrictive definition of Sunnah and Bida and innovation, okay, 
uh, and the, you know, the idea that what is meant by Islam is that it remains static. It's not correct. And it's true in Ibadat, okay, as you, you do not bring in new things. You bring uh, you, whatever you do must have a basis, whether it is prayer or dhikr or, or, or salah or istighfar, these all have a basis in the generals of, 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 the, uh, of the Quran and Hadith. Um, on, on Zakat al-Fitr, Zakat al-Fitr is, is food, at least in Maliki law, you give food, and you give food um, on behalf of those you are responsible for. Okay, so if you maintain your wife, and some scholars say that if your wife can pay her Zakat al-Fitr, uh, if she is wealthy and she's earning, she should be, do her own zakat of fitr. But if you maintain her, if you are the one that feeds her, or your house help, or your children that are not married, that are under your care, that you care, you 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 put you take zakat of fitr on their behalf. So your domestic aids, if they are under you, the Muslims, and you feed them and you take care of them, give the accommodation, you take your you you pay zakat of fitr on their behalf. You give to the poor. And to the needy, you are given to those who don't have. Usually, you will not be given a zakat to feed somebody you are feeding anyway. It does not make sense to me. You are you are given on his behalf. You take you count the if you have ten aids, you count ten um, sa'is, and you give that out to people who do not have. The zakat is given. We we know the the people that take zakat, the asnaf of thamania, the eight groups that take all that take zakat. Uh, this is these are seated in Surah Toba. So you go and you go and give it to them. Um, on social order and ibadah, you know, you know, when our hearts are not good, our deeds will not be good. And I think it's a very important question. We say we are Muslims. We go to the mosque and pray. Now Allah says, in the salat is and fashay wal munkar. Prayer um, stops um, evil deeds and, 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 and wrong deeds. Why is it that we go to pray all the time, we fast all the time, and then we are committing this evil? How do you have a Muslim who says he goes to, to mosque and salat, and then he comes to a mosque or a church and explodes the bomb and says, Allahu Akbar? How do you have somebody who says he's a Muslim go and kidnap people? Kidnap women, kidnap children, kidnap young girls, force them, let's say he's converted them to Islam, or force them as concubines or as wives. Because our hearts are not Islamic. We are focused so much on these external, uh, external things, the purity of the heart, the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love for humanity, the the fear of Allah, the, the knowledge that we are accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that is missing. How do you get a Muslim become a minister or a governor or, or have responsibility and all he's thinking of is how he's going to steal public funds to build a big house for himself or, or, or have a billions for his children and deny people what, what is the response? Why would you go? Why would you have that amana? When you know that the Prophet Sallallahu said about leadership, he says, amana, wa wa It is a trust. And on the day of judgment, it will be a source of um, bitterness, sadness, and regret for those who do not keep that trust properly. Only you, when you sit down there and you know that you're going to account to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for this wealth, you are going to answer for it. How do you get to that office and steal public funds, knowing that you are going to stand before Allah SWT to do that? Well, this is why you why you have social disorder. This is why I have social disorder. I mean, uh, there are many Muslims that, uh, that go and uh, we see them, okay, and they forget. You even have we even have had state governors who said they were having Sharia. They are they were leading the implementation of Sharia and they were stealing money. And buying hotels, there was a governor implementing Sharia in a Sharia state who stole public funds and bought a hotel in Lagos. And he says, Allahu Akbar. So why, why, and meanwhile, his state was left with no education, with no health care, and it is one of the most serious cases 
of insecurity, most serious examples of backwardness. How do you explain that you, you, you have this external religiosity, external belief, and then you have so much um, injustice? And that's why I said the, the, the obligations on the heart are far more important than those of the body. Greed, selfishness, wickedness, envy, these are much greater sins than zina, than, than homosexuality, than, than, than gambling. The sins of the heart are greater than the sins of, of, of the body. What is obligatory on the heart is stronger than what is obligatory on the external, because this is what Allah works with. So um, thank you for the question. We all have to look at our hearts uh, and look in, inside and be good people and good human beings. Uh, now, how do we correct uh, misconception? The, the, the only way you you uh, you, you correct uh, um, ibadah is knowledge. Read, read the Quran, read the Hadith, read read books of fiqh. Okay, understand how 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 these things are supposed are, suppo are supposed to be uh, uh, to uh, to be done. And remember always the foundation that uh, Fala has uh, has summarized that it is about love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You see, when, when you love the, the, the Arabs, the Arabs say, If your love is true, you obey the person you love. Because he who loves is obedient to the command of the loved one. If you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do what he loves. So you go, um, you, 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 you're doing this thing out of love for him. You're doing this thing with joy, with happiness. And therefore, because you want to please Allah, you find out how does he, what are the things that Allah wants? What does Allah want you to do? And Allah has given us indications. He showed you what he likes. He showed you how to pray. He showed you how to fast. He showed you uh, to take care of the poor. He showed you to be, to be of benefit to mankind. He showed you to spread his religion. He showed you to command what is good. He showed you to do justice. So to obey your parents, to love your these are only by that. If you do all of these things and you do them with pleasure, with love, because you are pleasing your Lord that you love, you have the happy life in this world and happy life in the hereafter. Thank you very much. Those are the questions that I the, the, the batch that I asked. We have a lot of questions left, but it's always a conflict between. What we what we committed to people, and what happened, and we try to live with our commitments. It's um by the clock here. We have seven minutes left to twelve, and uh, I have about fifteen questions here. There's no way I'm going to uh, ask them to be answered at all, because we have come to the last last lecture last lecture in Ramadan is so um, interesting, so strange that we've had five this Ramadan. We started just the Sunday before Ramadan and we progressed to this Sunday. And we would like to take advantage of the presence of the Khalifa amongst us to pray for us, to pray for our nation, um, pray for those who are suffering in all, any, any, any and all parts of the world, especially our country and the countries of those others that are on the platform. Pray for our president. Um, it's not a particularly easy uh, uh, place to govern. So many things are, they, they, they raise their heads, things that you and I, as we are growing, one familiar with. So somebody gets it, then the person is Christian. Another person gets it, then it's because that person is Muslim or woman or Igbo. Or so many things have um, come into, into play that only Allah can grant wisdom to that person who is in charge of our affairs. Pray for our health. Um, pray that we may have peace in our own time. 
Uh, pray for those on this platform. About 15 minutes into your lecture, we hit a thousand and we kept at any time for a long time over 50 people who couldn't get in and not counting those on, on, on YouTube, which consistently says to us that there's a need for what is being done. Uh, and there's a need for people like you who come to do it with us on this platform. Uh, and as I speak now, we still have 979 people who are on the platform. That, that, that's phenomenal. Pray for us. Uh, let us use the remaining time for that prayer. Bismillah. Yes, so shall we? Um, Salu ala Nabi al Kareem. Salamu alayhi wa sallam. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allahumma gfir lana ma qaddamna wa ma akharna wa ma a'lana wa ma asrarna wa ma anta alamu bihi minna. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun jihibul afu fa'afu anna. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun jihibul afu fa'afu anna. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun jihibul afu fa'afu anna. Allahumma ij'al jam'ana hadha jam'a marhuma wa ij'al tafarruqana bi ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'asuma wa la taj'al fina wa la minna wa la ma'ana shaqiyyan wa la mahruma. اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا وأصلح قائمتنا وولاة أمورنا اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا وأصلح قائمتنا وولاة أمورنا اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا وأصلح قائمتنا وولاة أمورنا اللهم اجعل هذا البلد آمنا مطمئنا رخاء سخاء وسائر بلاد المسلمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب إلينا أنت تواب الرحيم ربنا اكفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا كل الذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم اللهم اكسرنا من خشيتك ما تخول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا بصائب الدنيا ومتئنا اللهم بأسمعنا وأبسرنا وقواتنا أبدا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل صعرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من أعدانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مسيرنا واجعل الجنة هي دارنا وقرارنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين uh, We okay. pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to make this our gathering a gathering um, of under his rahma We pray to Allah that he should not place among us uh, anyone that is thrown close uh, that, is, that is thrown away from the doors of his mercy we pray to Allah to guide our leaders. We pray to Allah to give us peace in this country, to give us prosperity, to take care of the poor, to uh, help them survive. We pray to Allah to improve the economic circumstances we're in and to guide us along the straight path, to accept our fasting and our prayer and our reading of the Quran, to give us peace and harmony in our lands and, in, and, and, all, and all over the world. Uh, we pray to Allah to give his peace and blessings to his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to his companions, to his um, family, uh, to his wives and to his descendants and to forgive all of us our sins and to accept our fasting and to count us among those that will be in Al Jannah um, on the day that there will be no, um, no wealth that will, will benefit us and no family will benefit us. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim وَتُوبَ عَلَيْنَا كَانَتَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ أَمَّا يَسِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ شُكْرًا Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We pray for your long life as well and we pray that any time we come knock on your door you will always have things to tell us. Thank you. Thank God for your life. جزاكم الله خير. You may take your exit. We are grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. For the rest of us who are on the platform, um, all that is left for me to do is to say thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you have benefited from, from the different lecturers. They all vary. They all come with different things for us to learn. The idea is for us to be 
patient with them, learn as much as possible. And it's 12 hours. And um, I want to wish you Ramadan Karim, Eid Mubarak, uh, whenever it is, whether it's on Tuesday that we pray or it's on Wednesday that we pray. May Allah accept our prayers, accept our prayers on ourselves as individuals, accept our prayers on our families, accept our prayers on our community, accept our prayers on our state, on our country, and um, on all the things that are dear to us. And no matter how short or how long it is, when it is time, it make the transition easy for us and grant us um, a John of Fidelcy. For those who have lost their loved ones in the course of this Ramadan, may Allah grant, grant them uh, 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 grant their souls a peaceful uh, peaceful repose. Uh, grant them comfort of the grave. Uh, make things make their path easy for them. Comfort all those that they have left behind, um, especially people on this platform. Uh, if they have suffered such, up to yesterday we were still uh, going for a funeral of people that we love, and it will continue until Ramadan, uh, until Eid. May Allah be with us, guide us, give us peace in our own time. And um, we pray that we will be alive and gather again during the next Ramadan when we come with the 2025 annual Ramadan lecture series. For myself, for my wife, it's been a pleasure um, being your technicians, being your host. Um, we have learned uh, a lot by listening to people. It's, really, it's a real privilege. And finding your faces and your names and your presence on the platform uh, just keeps telling us that um, we can't stop. Every time we contemplate whether it's not necessarily this year, the kind of number that turns out on this platform, we said, okay, we'll continue. And we pray that for you, as well as for us, May this endeavor please Allah. May it uh, make us uh, uh, even more, more of uh, the servants as we have um, learned today. And I want to leave the platform for a couple of more minutes for you to greet yourselves if you have people you want to greet. And then by 12, 10, 12, 15, I will shut it down. Thank you very much. Okay, you may unmute yourselves now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Kola. 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 Thank you,